Hi, everybody. Welcome to our cycle of instruction um, workshop that we're presenting through the Labor and Literacy Library program. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen so that you all can see in a moment what's going on. Okay. Um, so again, welcome to everybody. We are recording this session, um, which is the cycle of instruction. Now, before we talk about workshop objectives, which is what I really do like to do at the beginning of every workshop, what I want to do first is, well, give you all a little pop quiz, because I think that's always fun, right? So my pop quiz is, what do all of these things have in common? Seasons, Ferris wheel, inflation and recession, the orbits of the planets. Any guesses? Photosynthesis. What do we think these all have in common? That it comes and goes around. Comes and goes around. And what can we think of another word for something that comes and goes around? It is our cycles. So just like all like our cycle of instruction that we're talking about right here or today, these all work in cycles as well. So during our cycle of instruction workshop, we're gonna talk about two different cycles, two important cycles. We're gonna talk about the cycle of teaching and learning because both of those do really work in cycles and understanding them, pardon me, <clears throat> understanding them is going to be very useful for you as an instructor. So that was my silly pop quiz just to get you guys thinking about cycles and how cycles work. So what I want to do now is just find out a little bit about why you're all here. So I'm going to ask you, since we are a nice small group, to unmute if you're on mute and just tell us why you're here, where are you from in your current role, and then just give me a little bit of an idea about what you're hoping to get out of today's workshop. And who wants to start? Start. Nathan, thank you. Uh, so the first one is, why am I here? So I'm here because, again, we're going back to in-person programs after we were closed for a month and without programs for almost two or three months. Uh, we are, I'm from the Atlantic City Free Public Library. And my, my role at the moment, it is instructor, especially computer instructor. And what I do expect from this workshop is learn more techniques that I can use for teaching, especially now the or like or programs that especially the ones that I'm gonna do which is going to be Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. Uh, and it's going to be different than IC3 because I, when we did IC3, it was more structures. Mm -hmm. Now it's more like everyone, everybody can sign and like how to handle like different levels of the computer at the same time okay. for people. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. How about you, Maria? And I realized that my first and my last question here are very similar. So feel free to combine them if you want. Okay. So I'm here um, trying to improve my techniques when helping my students. And I also want to be able to have them tell me what they need more to have them open up more to um, help me, you know, them express what they feel that they're not getting versus what they are getting. Um, I work at the Cumberland County Library. Um, I do um, full classroom teaching and individual one-on-one, -on -one. Um, and I'm getting all kinds of things now. Um, I have somebody wanting to help me, me help them do with um, stock market, stock market um, learning how to do like um, 
charts kind of a type of a thing to learn how to put their stuff on their stock market stuff. So I'm kind of getting all kinds of new things here, which is nice. So they're looking to create a spreadsheet and track things. That well, make no, they're actually going to use their program, but that has a way to do um, how to do lines and graphs and stuff. And she doesn't okay. know how to use that. So I'm going to be learning at the same time to help her. Interesting. <laughs> I've reviewed a few. So I get, I'm getting a lot of um, different things here. So um, hopefully well, this will all help me, you know, interact with everybody and get more people in. Interesting. I mean, one of the things we've talked about before is, once you start understanding computers, you start understanding computers and you can figure a lot out. I mean, personally, I don't think I could help somebody with stock stuff because that's not part of my background, but at least the computer part, you could probably help figure right. or I could it, help figure out. Yeah. Good, good. So, and make sure that you're definitely focusing on what you're supposed to be teaching not so much what other people think they need from you so if, as long as you're focusing on that computer part and you're good okay. i think that's great all righty so let's go ahead then and talk about why i think we're here so to flesh that out a little bit we're here to understand this like help you understand the cycle of instruction and then how to use it to make your workshops more effective and more engaging for your attendees. So let's take a quick look at this cycle just as a whole. And then I'm gonna break down each part for you as we go through this workshop. The first part of the cycle is to prime your students. I also call this part the hook. How do you hook your students? How do you get them interested in the class topic in what you're teaching? Once your students are hooked, then you want to explain your topic to them. If you're teaching your students how to complete a task or achieve a skill, you're then going to model how to complete the task. If you're teaching them um, how to create something, you're going to, again, model the end results of what you want them to see, to know, to how to do. Once your students have seen how to complete a task, you're then going to work together or collaborate to practice that task. After that, you want to assess how well your students have learned what you were teaching. Often people think assessments are really to grade students, an assessment or a test. A lot of people think that it's, I need to give them a grade and see, how, let them know how they did. A lot of times within the cycle of instructions, you're trying to do an assessment of what your students know so that you as the instructor can see whether you need to go back or whether you're able to move on. So after your assessment, you analyze what you've learned about your students, and this happens sometimes very quickly, and then you decide, I'm going to course correct. I'm going to go back and reteach a little bit of this, or now I can move forward into the next topic. And I want that to be really clear. This cycle of instruction isn't necessarily one class, one workshop, one lecture, one whatever. This cycle of instruction, you may do this over and over again throughout your class. Um, if Maria is teaching somebody how to use software to add lines and add circles and then put numbers on it, and I'm making all of that up, Maria, but you might prime them on how to or on what you're going to talk about explain first the lines make sure you go through the whole cycle but then you'll go into the um adding circles then you'll go through the cycle for numbers because adding numbers might be different so i hope you're understanding that what we're talking about is not just one class what we're talking about is the cycle of instruction for each skill each topic each thing that you're teaching does that make sense? Yeah, I think I do that um, on a regular basis because when I find that I'm in front of the students, I'll notice they may not get one thing as easy as another time. So I may have to readjust either my class material or find something that compares to what they're um, doing. So this is like a constant thing for me having to do that. Understanding this cycle even if you've never heard of it truly means that you understand what it's like to be an instructor to be a teacher because you understand 
how your students are learning and if they're learning. So I think that is wonderful that you're doing it without necessarily knowing it. Um, and you made a lot of good points that I'm going to circle back to when we go into the analyze, the assess, the analyze the course, correct? In terms of, okay, this didn't work so well. What do I do? Not just now to get them through it, but next time as well, which is, you called that out, which is great. <clears throat> um, oh, I forgot to click the cute little circle to go around the cycle as we talked about that, but you got to see it now. Okay. So those of you who attended our running a workshop workshop, you might remember that one of the things we talked about in terms of making a workshop effective is actually setting expectations for what you're going to teach at the very beginning of the workshop so that you stay on a course so that your attendees, your learners know what it is that they should expect out of the course. That way, when you've defined those goals, by the time you get to the end of the session, they can see, oh, that was what I was learned. I did learn all of those different things. So it's really important, again, to always start with outlining clear goals, clear outcomes for a workshop that, or a session that you're running. So what are our goals for this session? By the end of today's session, you should each <clears throat> know the phases of an effective cycle of instruction. So know all of those six parts. I'm gonna make sure that you understand each phase, how to use it, why to use it, why to use it in that particular order. And then I'm gonna make sure that you know when to pause and review, which Maria was just talking about how she knows how important that is already, and then when to move forward to the next topic or the next goal that you want to achieve. So let's jump into each of the phases <clears throat> of the cycle of instruction in a little bit more detail. Um, but first, always forget you want to always forget. Oh my goodness gracious. But first, do not forget or always please make sure you do instructions. You do, I'm sorry. Huh. Let's start that slide again. Always make sure that you take the time to do introductions as well as talk about your goals or your outcomes. Did we do this? Did we do our introductions? I see some nodding. We talked about our goals and outcomes. It was very simple, but we did. We said, who are you? Why are you here? What did you want to get out of the session? We then moved into our main goals for today. So what was our main goal for today? To learn what our um, the outline is, like what we're going to be teaching. The parts of this cycle of instruction. Yep. <clears throat> Each of the different parts that are within that cycle of instruction. Um, we talked about some more detailed goals, but big picture right now, you know you're going to leave here understanding the cycle of instruction. So the first part of the cycle that you're going to see is that you're priming your students for learning. Guesses on what that means, priming my students for learning. You didn't know I was going to make you talk the whole time, did you? Um, okay. I'm going to say um, it's just trying to make sure that you have everything that you're going to give to the students. Um, find out exactly what you want to teach them in what order and figure out so, how to um, pick up. I think <clears throat> that's super important. You're absolutely right that you want to get everything organized, that you want to be prepared, that you want to make sure, pardon me, that um, you have everything you need. I think that's priming you for your class. Um, what was the first thing we did after um, trying to figure out uh, who was standing behind Sarah. What was the first thing we did when we started this session? Does, does anybody remember? Get to know the student and yeah. what their goals mm -hmm. to the, they want to learn. Nathan, I did something right before that. Did I give you all a pop quiz? We just started talking about cycles. Priming is just getting somebody's mind to start thinking about what it is that you're going to cover in your session. So when priming might be as easy as, 
let me step back for a second. You're really priming your students because you want to make sure that they know why it's important that they pay attention, that they make you make sure they know why it's important that they're engaged in what it is you're talking about. I mean, honestly, why should I spend my time and energy listening to you teaching me this stuff? Is there a good reason? And sometimes it's super easy. You know, I used to work for a large corporation and, hey guys, I'm about to teach you our new payroll system and um, how to clock in and clock out and keep track of everything. And if you don't use it, you're not gonna get paid. That They're primed now. My students are ready to pay attention. My students are ready to learn the system because they have a good reason to do it. Other times it takes a bit more work. For example, if I said to you, okay, cycle of instruction, I'm gonna talk about this cycle that has six categories. Ready? You might not willingly come along for the ride on that. You're gonna be like, okay, these six categories, what, what are they for? What do they do? Why am I listening? Why do I need to pay attention? But we primed by talking about a cycle, we did our introductions and then we continued to talk about the big picture of how learning happens in a cycle. And without knowing it, Maria actually helped me by saying, I do that. I do that as an instructor. And we know Maria is a good instructor because we've all worked with her before. So I even, Maria helped me prime my students by talking about why it is that this cycle is gonna be important. Does that make sense? So I have a question for you. Yeah. yeah, I do have a question. So isn't this kind of similar to like when you're like, say you're telling them this is what we're learning today. Isn't that kind of similar, the same thing? It is kind of similar, but not only do you always want to explain to people <clears throat> what they're learning, but why? Why am I going to learn this? So I always think when I'm creating my... Um, agenda, my goals, my outcomes, use whatever word you want. It's so important for me to tell everybody why you should do this. So let's say, let's say that I'm teaching, um, let's say I'm teaching an Excel class. And in my Excel class, when I did my introductions, I learned that Maria wanted to make charts for tracking her stocks. I can actually use that as an example. Okay, folks, we're gonna learn how to make charts because you're probably gonna use these to compare all of your students' grades or Maria might use these to track her stocks or Nathan's gonna use these to figure out the percent of time that he's teaching and show a graph that shows teaching time versus non-teaching time. So by telling you that we're creating charts, now I'm also introducing why and I'm trying to make it to appropriate to each student. You can't always do that. You might not know your students that well. You might not, there might be things that you're gonna teach that a particular student will never use. Colleen might never ever use charts. And so therefore she's gonna be like, but why am I gonna use this? And the answer is you came to class today, you're gonna learn it. You might use it someday. I mean, honestly, sometimes that's the best you can do. So, but priming is very useful. It's not just explaining what you're going to teach, but it's explaining why it's hooking your students. I tried to do it in a silly way by just doing a pop quiz. So now we're talking about cycles, not even really a pop quiz if you think about it, but just let's try to have some fun. So we wanna try to link things to real life experiences. We wanna be silly and creative because sometimes that works for your classes as well. But always, if you can, connect the content to some sort of real life experience that maybe you've already taught or that you know is important to one of your students or to all of your students. That was a great question, Maria. Other questions on this? Okay, so prime, hook them, explain why this is so important. I always think of it as why is it important that I'm gonna pay attention to you and do what you're teaching me? The next thing you're gonna do is you're going to explain. Once you've got your students 
hooked on the topic, you're then going to explain the topic. And you want to be clear, you want to be concise. So now we're trying to get everybody on the same page so that they're all ready to understand um, what it is that you're about to be teaching. So for example, let's say that I was running a workshop on interview skills. And today's topic for my interview skills workshop is appropriate interview attire. Depending on my students, okay, I'm talking about appropriate interview attire, but do y'all know what the word attire means? Who can give me another definition of the word attire? We talk about the fact that it's dress. All right, what are the things that you need to keep track of? What are you wearing on the top, the bottom? What about your shoes? Um, what about the bag you may be carrying in? Um, even things like that piece of paper resume, you know, we might talk about what all of that is going to look like. So this is the information I need you all to know so that I can actually teach you what I plan on teaching you. And some of your students might already know everything. You probably all knew when I said interview attire, I meant your clothing. But depending on the students coming in, they may not have that vocabulary. They may not have um, had English as their first language and that might be a new word for them. So again, it's helpful to get everybody on the same page. So you prime your students, get them to understand why they're listening. Then you start explaining the topic as a whole. So we started talking about Attire means clothing, clothing means X, Y, and Z. And then from there, you're gonna go ahead and model the concept, okay? Do you understand the difference though between prime and explain? Maria's not quite sure. Um, and these all, you know why you don't is because they all flow together which is what makes your class seem so smooth. Like your students do not know that you're following this cycle. This is how I have always taught and you have all been in my classes before. I have always taught with that, like here's the big picture, here's why this is so important. And then gone through this cycle with pretty much everything that I'm teaching. Um, and did any of you ever, see that it was these steps that I was following? Did I, any of you recognize that? Because it all does flow together. Um, I had to turn on the thingy so I could see all of your faces. I had turned off my, uh, cat, my video for a little while. Um, so it's a little confusing, but Maria, um, when you teach, I'm trying to think of something. Do you ever teach people how to turn on and off their computer? Yes. I figured as much <laughs> knowing what, what your group is like. So you need to teach people, what do you tell them about it? Do you just say, okay, here's the on and off button, but don't ever press it to turn it off? No, or I kind you, of explain like what the computer is and what things we need to look for and, you know, not so that we don't have any problems with the computer or anything else. And then do you show them the buttons and the, right. the start? So you're doing it. Hey folks, we all have computers. We need to be able to turn them on and off. So let's talk about what happens if we do it right. What happens if we do it wrong? Okay. Now here is how you do it. So you're doing this. You just haven't used the terminology. Nathan, I've seen you teach and I know you do the same thing. You just haven't used the words for prime, explain, and then model. And then we'll go through the rest of them. But now that I explained it that way, does it feel like it makes a little bit more sense? And I see some nodding again, um, yes. which I figured I would just say, because this is this is recorded and, and people might be watching the recording and wondering what on earth she's answering to. Okay, so we talked about priming or hooking our students, explaining so I've got everybody on the same page so that things 
are going to make sense now that I'm modeling the concept. Modeling the concept is literally the actual teaching. So yes, teaching somebody that if you just press the power button on your computer, it's going to mess up your computer. Although I am referring to that as explain, that is teaching as well. Model is now that I've explained the all of the background, all of the other information involved, here's how you do it. So, and it could be that I'm teaching people how to write a resume. Hey, here's the final example, or here are a bunch of examples of bullet points for your resume. So I'm showing the good ones. So modeling the concept really is simply walking somebody through the step-by-step -step or showing them a completed project so we can now work towards that. So let's go back to my example of I'm the facilitator for a workshop skills session. And again, we're talking about the appropriate attire. We already went through what that means, what parts of clothing we're talking about, and all the other things that you're carrying around with you. I want to make sure that everybody knows it's important to be neat, to be put together. Um, we talked even about being ironed, wrinkle-free, like looking really good. Now that we're now that we've talked about it, do you think everybody has the same vision, the same picture of a good interview of good interview attire? No, I don't think so. Probably not. So I don't want to just leave my learners with me talking them through things. Now what I need to do is model or show them what it meant. Um, do you guys have any ideas on how you might do it? How would you model for somebody good interview attire? And I realize I don't mean be a model. <laughs> Sorry, that, that sort of <laughs> just caught that one. Um, go ahead, uh, Maria, you look, or Nathan, you're unmuted, go ahead. I think I would start the first step, like showing them pictures. Yeah, show examples. Show examples of things that, you should wear and that you shouldn't wear. So I might just go on to Google and get some good pictures of somebody who's dressed for an interview, maybe get pictures of somebody in a pair of sweatpants um, and messy sneakers. And maybe I would put up a picture of somebody in a really nice dress, but it's all wrinkled. You know, so let's talk about what parts are good. Let's talk about what parts are bad. So I, as the instructor, am modeling. I am showing how to do something or what something looks like. What is the correct end goal? Are y'all with me so far? Fabulous. Once you model, you want to collaborate. Collaborate. Let's do it together as a group. Because once my students have seen the model, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have taken it all in. I may have thought I did a great job of explaining everything, but I still, I don't want to just say, okay, go to your interview now. Let's make sure that what I modeled you took in and it makes sense. So let's look at it together as a group. So we're gonna practice collaboratively. We're gonna do it together. Um, again, what are some of the different ideas for how we could get our students to show us good interview outfits or how could we collaborate together to make sure that we haven't left them on their own to try it and get it wrong, but let's work on it together. And these are not two super tricky questions. So I'm just curious what ideas you might have, or you have I can them? tell you mine first, go ahead. Or could you have them actually try to look online and like say, if you're doing the attire, have them try to find something they think would be appropriate to show you to see if there's, you know, a comparison I to what they're supposed to. Love that idea that I want them to find something, but I haven't yet seen if all of my students actually understood what good interview attire meant. So you're right, Maria, but I'm not quite ready to ask them to do that yet. 
I first want to be able to be sure that as a group, we've all understood because I showed pictures and I said, good, not so good. Now, how do I do it as a group so that all of my students get to practice in a stress-free way? Any, any thoughts on that? All right, let me tell you what I would do. And um, even though I have been teaching y'all over Zoom for how long now? Probably you're not teaching over Zoom. And even if you are, I like to try to do some interactivity. Um, so sorry, the one thing I did not prepare, um, I love to give people a quiet way to give me an answer. So what I would do is I would put a, a yes and a no card on each student's desk or give them a green card and a red card and have them have green is good. Yes, I could wear this to an interview. Red probably wouldn't wanna wear that to an interview. So I would give each student a green and a red card. Maybe I'll show images on screen and I'll have them hold up the correct color card. Oh, that one's good for an interview. Oh, that one's not great for an interview. Over Zoom, what I might ask him to do is just use the raise hand button for yes ones and leave it down for no. What's nice about this is nobody feels called out that they got it wrong. You are still teaching and helping them understand the great and the not so great interview attire. We're and if you start to see that people are still really confused, you then go back and say, all right, so let's talk about why this one isn't so great. Or, oh yes, I see that almost all of you said this was perfect. Let's talk about what makes this a perfect outfit. Um, that way you're still teaching and making sure you have everybody with you before it's their job to figure it out on their own. And then you can see where the questions are. Maybe you showed a beautiful picture of somebody dressed wonderfully in a pair of ratty old sneakers. Everybody's like, yep, green, that's a good interview outfit. And you can say, oh, you know what? We didn't talk about enough with shoes. So let's talk about shoes now. Um, and I know these are very silly examples and that you very likely don't have to go in this much detail for teaching somebody about clothing, but I wanted to make that part of it easy so that you understand that collaborate is now that my students have seen how to do this or have learned this, let's work as a group to just be sure everybody really does get it. So now I don't do that, but I have, what I do is I've learned to pay attention to their faces. And typically from there, I see who doesn't understand. And then I'll say, well, how about we try this again? And I could see everybody like nodding. So I kind of learned that I have to look at their faces. Absolutely. And that's why it's important to me to be able to face the class when I'm teaching versus having my back towards them, because yep. that way I've been able to see. But would you still need to have to do those yes or no type of cards? And it depends on the thing. Um, one of the things that we do with computer training is let me show you all how to do this. All right, now we're gonna go through the room and each of you is gonna tell me what's the next step. And so again, it's who is paying attention, who is now hiding because, which is what you're seeing, who's now hiding because I'm gonna ask for the next step. Often um, with groups that are learning computers, especially everybody's sort of cheering each other on because if you're coming to me to learn how to turn on and off your computer, you're all stuck in that same boat and you know that you all need those skills. So having the group work together to teach you is still collaborating, having them work as a team, and then you can still see, oh, they understood except for they keep forgetting to go to this menu or they keep forgetting, oh, I have to click in this cell before I can then format it. So let's talk through that one part again. Let's put something up on the wall that says, don't forget to click in the cell, you know, different ways. So again, you're doing it. It's just not as focused and planned 
But if you plan these steps, you then like it becomes so smooth for you. So often when I am writing out my not so much lesson plans, but just my notes on how I'm going to teach you how to do something, I put these in my head. How am I going to get people engaged? What is my introduction that will prime them? All right, what are the things I need to make sure they know before I can even teach them? And I have to explain all of those things first. And then I'm going to show them the steps. And maybe that's the part I model. I don't have to even write it out because I like know how to format an Excel spreadsheet because I've done it for 27 years. You know, but then I have to write out, okay, how am I going to figure out what it is? How am I going to figure out that my students are really getting it? Like, how are we going to practice that extra time? And I always think of it as an extra practice because that's going to help me see, Maria, what you were seeing, those like blank stares. Um, and then, uh, wait, before I move on to assess, other questions on this? No. So, and Maria, again, not to keep calling you out, except you keep talking to me, which I love. Um, I know that you're doing this because I listen to how you teach. You just aren't mapping it out necessarily. You're using your students' faces and you're going, all right, so we're confused where, or we're doing this, or we're, yeah. Um, the other thing I want to call out is early in this session, you said, when I find that my students have been confused, I review it again, and then I figure out my lesson plan. That's huge. We don't have that written on the screen, but you should always use what you learned. What was that part in my class that didn't go well? How am I gonna fix that for next time? So you're gonna wanna make sure, um, you're gonna wanna make sure that you can do those revisions. I actually, have already written down something while we were working together that I need to change next time I run this session because it didn't quite work the way I wanted to. So, so sorry that you guys got stuck being my test subjects. <laughs> All right, um, should we move on to assess? All right, we'll see, we'll see what happens. So we collaborated, whoop. There we go. I am going the wrong way. That's why that's happening. Assess. Assess again doesn't have to be a formal test, but I need to make sure that now everybody in the group has successfully learned what I'm teaching because so-and-so who's sitting in the back of the room actually was watching the green and red cards as they came up and that's how they knew which one to lift. So I really need to be sure that they understand. Otherwise we might need to work together on this a little bit more. So it's really important to assess so that everybody understands and everybody has mastered the concept, not just part of the group. It is so easy to lose those students that are struggling. So I'm trying to make sure, okay, fabulous. Um, this is where Maria's idea of, hey, go online, find me some pictures. Um, and then we'll just print out your good work, your, I'm sorry, good interview outfit so we can see. So I'm gonna give you all 10 minutes. I'm not making you do this for real. I'm gonna give you all 10 minutes. I want you to find a picture of a top, a bottom, shoes, and a bag that you're gonna wear or bring to your interview. And then you're gonna come back and depending on the class, I might say to them, as you finish this, I want you to each come to me and show it to me or as once we're all finished, I'm going to have everybody show it on the screen to the rest of the class. Why do you think I might do one versus the other? Any get, so if I'm worried about Joe in the back of the room, because I really think that Joe was picking up the red and the green cards based on what Joe saw 
in the classroom. Do you think I would want to have people show me first or show the whole class first? Show you first. Show me first. I want my students to be engaged and comfortable and I want them to continue to want to learn. And if they feel embarrassed, they might not ask a question next time. They might not come back to my class. So my assessment might change based on how I think my students are doing. Um, so that was a great answer. I might also just be walking around and keeping an eye on those students that I know were struggling a little bit um, and having them, helping them before we do the in-class presentation. I mean, I think you both saw this in some of my other class. Um, now that I'm saying that I'm not sure you did, um, sometimes when I'm teaching, especially a Zoom class, I know which are my students that are struggling with the computer, which of my students really get it. I will ask my students who are struggling, I will ask them to share their screen and now I'm going to walk them through all the steps so I can see that they're following along. It doesn't, I don't ask them, hey, tell me the steps. Hey, let's model this. I want uh, Sarah, I'm going to have you show your screen and I'm going to tell you the steps or Sarah's going to show the screen and I'm going to ask Nathan to tell you the steps. Sometimes this happens on the fly. It does not matter that you have planned how you're going to prime your class. All of the things you've listed that you need to explain. You have modeled beautifully. You had the whole group collaborate. You know, you still are going to have that thing that happens where you're going to have to go, huh, let me just think of another way to make sure everybody is with me. But then your assessment becomes that final, hmm, are they all with me? And then from there, you analyze and course correct. Um, and again, you can't necessarily plan for your course correction because you don't necessarily know What's the part that was going to be difficult? What's the part that was going to be easy? You know, and even if always my students are confused about shoes, but this class tops is what confused them. And I have to course correct there. So you, again, on the flyer, you finished your assessment. Did they get it all? Um, if yes, hey, Here's some of the things you can do on your own. And then we're gonna move on and do um, resume writing next. Or, huh, they didn't understand this. So let's go back and see not only what I can do to reinforce that particular skill, concept, topic, but again, how am I gonna change my workshop for next time? I have um, a question for you. Absolutely. So. Um, I'll give you an example of what I do in class, but I'm not sure where it falls into this scenario here. So what I do is when we're going to go over something, we actually tell them to look at the board, what I'm doing. I show them exactly what I'm doing. Then after that, we do a step-by-step -step together. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I give them a, a, a one by themselves to do. And then I walk around to see who needs help. But I'm not sure what part of the cycle so that would be you in. gave them the step you said watch my board who wants to guess what that was watch my board where does that fall in here go ahead nathan i think it would be a model you're absolutely right you showed them then you had everybody do it together so you're collaborating Yep. And then she gives them an assignment and they're working on it on their own. And she's walking around to um, reinforce learning, to support the learning. So at that point, having them do it on their own is what? Assess. Perfect. Maria, do you ever stop and start over? Have you ever had your class so confused that you actually say, okay, hold on folks. Let's look at the board again. And we are going to go through those steps. Have you ever had that happen? Uh, yes, I do. But I think my the problem I find in that case is typically somebody's trying to write notes, and I tell them, 
well, let's first do this. And then if you want to take time afterwards to do the notes, because they want to do the notes so that they know how to do it, but they're missing the steps in between. So that's mm -hmm. where I'm having like some issues. Do you have any course materials? Yes, I always have something handed out to give them. It doesn't have like detail every step, but it gives them like, you know, the Enough basic thing that we just did. Would but you sometimes can, they want to do it in their own. <laughs> I, that I totally understand, like wanting to take notes on their own. Would you consider writing out the steps and handing it out after? Hey folks, and I'm gonna show you how to do this. I'm gonna have you practice. I do want you to try on your own because the more you can do it on your own, while I'm standing right here, that means you're going to be more likely to do it without me. However, once we're all done, I'm going to give you the step by steps as well so you can use them for reference later. Would you consider something like that? Um, yeah, I do. I do give them like a step by step. Like it's, it doesn't say, well, you have to be, um, it gives them like step one this, this is what you're looking for. Step two, this is what you can click on and that's it but they want to add extra things in there and mm. that's where I'm finding the problem of you know how do I get them to to pay attention while we're doing but you know because what I'll do is I'll tell them look up here we're going to have I'll give you a chance to do this but I want you to see what I'm doing first then we're going to do it together and then I'll give you one to try by yourself so um sometimes that works I'm going to say most of the times it does, but once in a while I do have one or two yeah. that just can't get rid of the note stuff. Yeah. And usually and I, that last step is where I give them the actual instruction. Okay, you know, click here, open this program, um, you know, and that's the last step that they have. And they have it before class starts. Right. Um, yeah, so I got, can I interrupt one sec, Kristen? Please, Colleen. Yeah. I've had that happen to me too, Maria, so much where people really want to take notes step by step. So they're trying to follow you, but they can't help themselves, but try and write down each step. And I think kind of like what Kristen is saying, I just make sure that they please focus on me right now. Let me show you. And then when you have your practice time, you're going to have time to be able to write down each and every step that you did but focus on what I'm saying and what I'm showing you right now, and then repeat. Um, too many students, when you're doing computer training, when they're taking notes, they stop listening completely. Yeah. And well, that's a good, I like that you said that when you do your own exercise, you can take the notes then. So maybe if I throw that in, maybe that will be us. So that I like that. Okay. Yeah. Cause Thanks. then when they're doing it, they can, they can be like almost like talking to their computer going, okay, that's the first step. Let me write that down. <laughs> now I'm going to do, oh, that's right. The second step. But when you're speaking and showing and you want them to do it. Yeah. That's yeah. That's the okay. brain like and the that. hand. Yeah. Like <laughs> And another trick that I've used, because sometimes you're not going to get a note taker to stop, I repeat the steps. I'm like, okay, so far we've done blah, blah. And then we opened Excel, we clicked on file, we click, like, I will say the steps over so that that person who was taking notes is catching up and the other people just hear it as, oh, Kristen's reviewing this for me. And I find that that is, I mean, I think review is great for everybody. How many times have I stopped this class and said, all right, so I primed you by doing this. And then I explained, and I, you've heard me say this cycle a zillion times, and it wasn't to give anybody time. It, it was literally because it's important that repetition really is useful. And each time I explained the steps, I tried to use slightly different words so that I was making sure everybody was getting a definition that really jived for them. So there's a lot of different possibilities and I love all your questions. They're all about how am I gonna make my classes better and help my students learn better? I love that. Other questions on um, the, 
assess and course, I'm sorry, analyze and course correct or on any of these so far. And then do you restart? Time up. What do you do next? So once you've completed the cycle all the way through, you don't have to course correct anymore. Folks have gotten it. What is the next thing you do? Do you have time to move on to the next topic? Um, and time is, workshop time is always limited. Eventually your workshops have to end. So it is really important that you focus on getting through the materials in a specific amount of time. You're gonna to wanna to practice your workshops. It's really important that you practice saying all of these things out loud. Apparently I struggled a bit in the beginning, so I need to practice speaking. I forget what slide I kept messing up, but I need to practice just pronunciation for y'all. Um, but you definitely wanna practice through your workshops. One of the other things you're gonna notice about time is you can't always do it all. Um, I had no worry that the students in this session would really struggle with any of these definitions. So we haven't done individual assessments, but we're all working as a group towards that same goal of how do I make my workshops successful? Um, so what I decided was that I would make sure that at the end we had a large group assessment, um, but that if there were areas I was unclear, I was gonna redesign this workshop for the next time I run it. So maybe I do need to do individual assessments. So when you're done with your cycle, then you have to decide what is the next thing. Before we talk about the how did we do, how do you all feel, red or green? Do you feel red about, I don't understand the cycle of instruction. Do you feel green? I, I think I'm getting it. You just have to tell me. You can put it in chat if you don't want to say it out loud. Well, you're all I, looking for like a red okay. or a green emoji. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're I, doing, right, Nathan? I, I, it makes so much sense now. Again, it's like now that that it, it it is explained like this, you can see like yeah, I do this even if I I'm doing it without noticing that I'm doing it. Yep. Yeah, and now that you realize you've been doing it, and you're gonna see it, you're gonna start to plan for it even more because you you can see how it works and how it makes sense. Um, Maria, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, I, I do see how it works. I just haven't really, like, I don't know if I put down on paper how I do it. Like, I know what I'm going to be teaching that day. I write down. So I kind of try to get a little bit more like having a list. And like, you had those questions, like, what do they need to learn? So that would be nice to have in something like this is the list of questions you actually ask so that I know that when I'm doing my class, I've asked all these questions, like what they're supposed to learn, you know, um, what they're going to get out of it. You were asking it back. Now this is being recorded, so I can go back and listen to it, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Because I'm trying to think of where, was it, what's the big idea of the workshop? What do I want them to take away? My, I think that's my, where I've been. Um, you were asking, you were saying what like um let's see I wrote it down. Oh, a note take I'm a note taker too I'm just messing with you <laughs> um divine like what you're teaching in the outline um did they understand the instruction um oh I think yeah I think each of them has sort of some questions to right. to, to guide mention you. them, but I can't write that fast. So, but oh, it's all going to be on Canvas. If I yes. can go back and listen to this it. PowerPoint will be on Canvas. The <clears throat> There's a recording, so you can go back and sort of skim through different parts of it. And I have to remember what slide we were on. Um, oh, we said, how did we do? And then agree or disagree. So 
The first goal, and I use, I put the red and green on the slide as well, just for fun, but the first goal. So let's see if we <clears throat> achieved that first goal of the workshop, but you know the phases of the effective cycle of instruction. So I've developed a fun little um, exercise for us. And there's a couple of ways that we could do this exercise to assess what you're what you've remembered from this i could call on each of you and ask you each to turn on your annotation tools and write in the boxes for me or we could put the numbers next to each of the different words or i could just say okay somebody call out what should go in box number one so and again this wasn't because i thought you needed this level of review of assessment but so that you just get some different ideas of different fun ways to review things with your students and to collaborate together. Um, does anybody want to start, though? Who, who can tell me what number one is? Go ahead, Nathan. Prime. All right. Do we agree with him? Yes. Thank you. All right, number two. Explain. Beautiful. The words are coming up as I type them, yes? Yes. Love it. What's number three, friends? Motto. Perfect. After you model. Collaborate. Yes, do it together. Make sure that every... <laughs> collaborate make sure that everybody really followed along with that model from collaboration assess perfect and then after you assess what do you do analyze and who can tell me again what when we analyze and course correct what are we trying to do making sure that everybody's learned what they needed to learn and if not then maybe figure out a way to go back and correct Perfect. it so if it were me goal number one i'm thinking yep you all got whoops goal number one or we all achieved goal number one together so i just need to erase my little drawings clear all Perfect. So you all know the phases of the cycle of instruction and then understand each the expectations for each phase. So again, made a fun little uh, drawing here for you. Again, you I could have each of you draw lines from one to another. Um, <clears throat> we could number them, match them. However, if this was a worksheet, I would hand it out and let each of you do it. I might not take it back, but then I would have the whole group review it. So there's lots of ways to do all of those things. So let's draw some lines. All right, describe the topic in detail. Which word is that? Would that be explained? Perfect. Share a concrete example or how the step-by-step -step process works. So I'm either gonna show you a good outfit or I'm gonna teach you how to make a chart. Model. Beautiful. Checking for understanding. Assess. Perfect. When do I decide if a review is needed or if a new topic can be introduced? Analyze and course correct. You got it. I've been speaking and I'm on mute and I noticed that. Oh. <laughs> Hopefully you've been saying the right answers, Nathan. Good. <laughs> He's nodding now. Um, introducing a topic to help your students make a connection. Prime. Beautiful. And then working together to practice. Collaborate. You got it. Whoops, I'm not very good at drawing with my mouse. 
Fabulous. So it looks like we are all feeling comfortable with now the definitions of each of these parts. So we know the parts of the cycle. Hang on while I get rid of these little lines so that we can see the next thing. Clear my drawings. We're going to move to the next slide. We understand the expectations. We know how to define each phase. Um, and then in terms of when do you pause and review? Um, so many times, so many times you might have to pause and review. Every time there was a question, we kind of paused and went through everything. We practice things. You wanna make sure that you're planning a specific assessment or review similar to the couple that we did but throughout today's class, we really did talk through um, all of these parts of the cycle of instruction over and over and over again. So before I move on to our next steps, I do just wanna be sure, check if anybody has any questions about any of the goals or feel like they didn't meet or we didn't achieve any of these goals? I frequently will take silence for Kristen's doing a good job. And so we don't have any more questions, although you all know that you can always reach out to me. So at the end of every session, I think it's very important that after you review, after you make sure that you've achieved your goals, that you talk about next steps. And frequently next steps are where to get more information, um, where to find out more about a topic, what homework I might want to give you. My specific next steps for anybody who's watching today's recording, I'm going to ask you to go down into the um, comments box. If you're watching this on YouTube, you would go down into the comments box and just answer those few items or put in those few items that are in there. And then if you're for everybody in this session, some next steps. Um, think about what are some of the other workshops that you might want to attend. You might want to go into the running a workshop workshop. Um, if you're working one-on-one -on -one with students, there's a tutor training workshop that you could look at as well. Um, the next one sort of that flows through this cycle is called creating lesson plans. So you might want to look at creating lesson plans as well. And then I want you to start thinking, are you gonna attend some of the workshops in a box that we've offered uh, or that we are offering because you might start using them in your library as well. So those are some of the next steps for this. And again, always, always, we are available to you. We've got our email address up on the screen. Y'all know how to reach out to us. Um, you're welcome to stick around at the end of this session. So if you have any other questions, comments, thoughts and ideas, please feel free to stick around or reach out to us. And thank you so much. You guys, this was a fun session. Thank you. Thank you. You're um, very welcome. Well, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.